Well, I think I'll get started. We have a lot to go through this evening and I really appreciate your time and joining us. Um, good evening and welcome. And we're excited to, from, to learn from you and get your insight to help develop this plan area. So really appreciate the time that you're spending with us this evening. Um, to let you know, we are recording this meeting and it will be posted on the website for information if you'd like to look at further at a, at a later date or if you can let other people know that it's available. I'll go through some of the Zoom control options for the meeting to help you navigate this meeting. Uh, there's a black bar menu at the top of the screen. Uh, if you are not speaking, if you could please hit the unmute button to avoid getting any kind of feedback or extra noises. Um, you can start your video if you are asked to come on screen by clicking on that icon as well. And if you check onto the participants list, you can see who are others and raise your hand in this particular area of the, of the tool. And then if you'd like to chat, which is a feature we'll be using often tonight, please click on the chat feature and you can ask questions or provide your input at any time. And we will see those. And then the view option on the far right side allows a Zoom feature. Uh, a few of the map Sorry about that. Um, appreciate your patience as we go through this um, technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. Um, I keep getting muted. So um, the Zoom feature there, uh, it, you can use that. Hi, Patty, it's Noelle, I'm here to help. We'll go ahead and okay. admit everyone into the room and you don't have to worry about clicking on anything and then maybe your speaker will stay on easily. Okay, thank you. I keep, is that what's happening? I get unmuted. My turn to be muted, sorry about that. It might be, so let's have our coworkers let everyone in the waiting room and, and um, we'll just follow your prompts here for the presentation. Okay, I, so another feature to utilize during the meeting is our Zoom feature. Um, the, some of the maps may, if they're not easy to read on your screen or the information, you can elect to go in there under view options button and select on this, the screen choice or zoom level that makes it easier for you to navigate and read the information on the screen. If there are any, I, I can't tell, but if there are any phone participants, um, the commands that you can use are star six and that allows you to toggle mute and unmute. And then star nine allows you to raise your hand and if you would like to speak. Next slide, please. First of all, my name is Patty McCartney. I'm the long range planner in the community and economic development division. I would like to introduce our team tonight um, and they who will be presenting is Cheryl Drake, senior long range, long range planner, Jake Nichols, who is also a senior long range planner and other team members who have joined us this evening are Noel Oberg, Rob Smetana and Allison Trimbley. I'll quickly go over the agenda. Uh, we will first of all give an overview of the new town sub area plan area and provide background information on the existing land use and transportation information. We also will be presenting some redevelopment potential um, design information. And then on the fourth part of our, of our presentation, it'll be an interactive portion, which we'll be seeking your comments and insight on the opportunities and challenges within this area. And then finally, we'll conclude with next steps and questions. The city is currently in the first phase of developing this plan, and it is anticipated it will be completed by the end of this year. Your participation tonight and at any time is greatly appreciated and an important part of this process to create the plan. Your vision and ideas will be used to create the goals and policies of this document 
it to help guide future redevelopment or development in this area. Next slide. Oh, you're there. I'm sorry, Noel. Um, first of all, I'll explain what sub area planning is. It's it's when it's a planning effort that focuses on specific geographic areas within the city to create the goals and policies for topics such as land use, transportation, and others. The city has identified several focus areas to develop these sub area plans, including the new town area, and it is. These are areas that are anticipated to develop or redevelop in the next five to 10 years. The sub area plan provides a guide for development in this area or those areas over the next 20 years. The new town plan area will sub area plan will also continue with previous planning efforts of the city comprehensive plan, land development code, Arvada transit station, and it will also build off of the work done through a vision for Newtown Arvada study. Next slide, please. The Newtown sub area is generally located in the commercial areas along Wadsworth Boulevard and bypass between the Gold Line tracks on the north and Interstate 70 to the south. Arvada Marketplace Center along 52nd Avenue will also be included. The study area is shown on the map within the red shaded areas and the perimeter influence areas are highlighted on the map in the blue shaded areas. Influence areas are the communities and neighborhoods that surround the study area. And now I would like to introduce Cheryl Drake who will continue with the presentation. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm going to learn as we go tonight. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We're, we're glad you were able to take some time um, and help us out with this plan. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of sort of the existing conditions. Um, as Patty mentioned, the study area is the area that you see on the map before you in both a red outline and it's basically red within the interior. It's approximately 250 acres and is currently a retail area, which is basically auto centric. The major retailers include Costco, Home Depot, and Lowe's. And on the south side, again, Patty mentioned we have the Arvada Marketplace, which is um, anchored by Sam's Club, as well as has many smaller retailers and some restaurants. Um, there are limited number of east and west streets which cross again across Wazard Boulevard, which limits the access into the commercial areas. The influence area, which is within that blue boundary, surrounds our study area and includes the Columbine neighborhood to the east, which is primarily single family and includes Foster Elementary, as well as the Foster and Columbine parks. To the west of the study area, the uses are primarily low to medium density residential. The area adjacent to Allison Street is experiencing some infill development, primarily with for sale townhomes. Next slide, please. Um, this this um, map just highlights some current development activity that we have seen in the area, both within the study area and the influence area. Within the study area, you'll see at the very top of the study area, there's a brown shaded area. That is the Old Town Residences um, Project, which is a 252 market a unit market rate development. Directly south of that is a red shaded area. That is the Arvada TOD South project, which includes 128 guest room hotel and a total of about 15,000 square feet of retail and restaurant space. <clears throat> Within the influence area, um, we have um, some proposed development of the Grandview Station, which is on the north side of Grandview and includes 14 for sale attached dwelling units above 4,000 square feet of retail space. Um, the remainder of new developments include some which are currently under construction, being the Old Town Commons at 54th and Allison with eight townhomes, um, Allison Park just north of 52nd and Allison with 35 new attached homes, and Tower View Townhomes at 51st and Yarrow. And that project has two phases, the first phase of which is under construction. Um, two other proposals which we're currently reviewing include the Allison Village project at 54th and Allison. And this is a redevelopment of an existing multifamily project, which will add additional units and provide um, an option for some affordable living. 
The Clear Creek Commons development at 52nd and Marshall consists of 276 proposed multifamily units. Next slide, please. So this shows the existing zoning, which is now in place within the study in the influence areas. In 2020, the city updated the land development code and with all of the new regulations, it offers new opportunities for redevelopment, which is consistent with the Arvada Comprehensive Plan and the ULI TAP Plan, which Patty mentioned. New zoning districts were created, which provide opportunity for mixed use urban development that encompasses office development, high density residential and retail development. The entire study area consists of mixed use zoning districts with varying heights, range, which range from 45 to 120 feet, which would be permitted with some redevelopment. The lighter colored pink areas are the lowest um, height levels, and that's the lowest height level is 45 feet. As the colors darken, so do the heights that are permitted. So you can see um, they, they range from the 45 and gently move up from 65 to 80 and then to 120 feet in the Arvada marketplace. Next slide, please. So with this increased um, ability for high development, we wanted to provide some protection to the existing single family development to the east, which is Columbine, the Columbine neighborhood. Um, so the heights transitions requirements were put into place, which require that within 45 feet of a district boundary of the RN zoning district, which Columbine um, neighborhood is, is zoned RN, the maximum heights can be no higher than the height that's allowed in that district, which in this case is 28 feet. In addition to the establishment of new zoning districts, the parking requirements were also revisited and changed. The standards were adjusted to be consistent with the current development trends in the area, as well as the unique location of the study area in a TOD influence area. The multifamily standards are now based on the number of bedrooms rather than just strictly on a per unit basis. Um, the single family standards were slightly reduced. Restaurant standards are now based on square, uh, square footage rather than the number of seats. And the standards for office and retail services were reduced. So this now, we now have a situation where we have um, existing development, which has excess parking. Um, so that allows opportunities for some redevelopment of these parking areas. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jake, who's going to talk to us some about potential um, ideas for redevelopment design. Thank you, Cheryl. Hello, uh, my name is Jake Mitchells. I'm a senior planner with the city, as uh, Patty mentioned. So, uh, you know, based on what Cheryl told you, we have new zoning, we have new heights. Um, one aspect of this sub area plan is really to guide future redevelopment in the area. And th there are really two primary ways redevelopment can happen. Uh, typical way that we see most often and we'll most likely see is kind of or what we call organically or, or lot by lot. So an individual property owner chooses to redevelop their lot, and they move forward and, and do that. However, there is a, a, another option that, that could be feasible in this area, given some of the, the size of the, the sub area and some of the individual properties. Um, and that's a mixed use center. And before I get into what a mixed use center is, I just wanna make sure we're all understanding uh, what mixed use is. Mixed use is, is just a mix of land uses uh, and, and land uses can be a commercial, residential, uh, industrial, uh, civic land uses, those types of things. So mixed use can occur in two different ways. It can occur what's called horizontal mixed use, which is a mix of uses spread across a given, a given area or given district, or vertical mixed use, which is a, a building that has different uses on the ground floor, such as retail or, or office. And then on the upper floors, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have residential or, or offices. And so what a mixed use center is, is it kind of combines both of those. It's, it's mixed use horizontally and it's mixed use vertically. And that's kind of the simplest way I can describe it. Um, there, there really are strengths and weaknesses to both approaches of redevelopment. I'll go over those briefly. Uh, land is obviously a, a strength for the organic, uh, organic lot by lot method. If you have a piece of land, you can redevelop it. 
Uh, mixed use centers often take uh, you know, land assembly, acquiring multiple parcels, putting them together uh, to get enough land to, to do an actual center. Uh, it also takes the right developer to do a center. You know, not not anybody is, uh, can you know obviously finance it or has the wherewithal. It's a longer process. It takes some time to do not only to acquire the land but to complete the build out of the of the center. And uh, as opposed to the lot by lot method, you just you own the property and you redevelop it. Uh, similarly, similarly, uh, it's much easier to comply with the code in a lot by lot method. You you have zoning, you have clear and objective development standards, you meet those standards, you get approval. With the mixed use centers, they typically go through what's called a PUD process and planned unit development. It's really a custom zone district and you go through every detail of that of that district with the developer and city staff and really plan the whole thing out. So it's again, a much more onerous process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Cohesive design that's a, a, typically can be a strength of a mixed use center. It's being developed by one developer or development group. So they have much more control over what do the buildings look like? What does the streetscape look like? Uh, the landscaping treatments, the, the site amenities, benches, flower pots, anything and everything. Uh, now, some of that can be done for, uh, you know, within a district uh, through more stringent design standards than are typically found in a land development code. And we've seen that in some areas, obviously Old Town uh, has, has something similar that it requires a little bit more cohesion uh, amongst those elements. Uh, common open space and amenities, that's another strength of, of the mixed use center. The developer is going to set aside large you know, pieces of, of land that can be used for common open space, whether that be more of an urban hardscape or, or a more natural park. Uh, and you know, versus lot by lot, you have each lot developing. You can't get that large contiguous piece of property that you can uh, develop into something that can really be usable for, for a large group of people. Now we, in our land development code, what we did adopt uh, something called small urban parks. And it's a requirement for properties zoned MX, all but the MX in zone district, but the MX zone properties, they have to dedicate a certain amount of their property for when they redevelop for uh, publicly accessible, but privately owned and maintained common spaces. So that's kind of a way we're hoping we can get at some of these, these common open spaces uh, through even a, a lot by lot development pattern. Parking is another thing that uh, mixed use centers do do real well. Uh, they typically will uh, concentrate parking and disperse it throughout the site, usually through structured parking. Uh, you know, this this does a number of things. One, uh, it, it reduces the amount of conflicts uh, at the you know pedestrian vehicle conflicts. You don't have you don't have a driveway accessing each property, uh, so you, you can have you can also have a more continuous street wall. Uh, so, so it looks more like a, a down, like a, a main street. Uh, also, it allows for shared parking. You know, in any in any district, you have different buildings that have different uh, kind of peak demand times. You know, restaurants and movie theaters obviously have later demand times, and and offices have earlier uh, peak demand for parking. So, by concentrating those in a mixed use center, you can actually have a little less parking holistically because you have shared uh, shared parking. Uh, versus any building that develops, they have to essentially park for their peak demand time. Uh, and so a lot of the time that parking sits unused. And then lastly, uh, internal connectivity. The mixed use centers can plan for that. They know where every building's gonna be, so they can plan for internal connectivity in terms of, of uh, sidewalks or, or alleys for vehicles. Uh, you know, it, whereas if a lot by lot development is happening and somebody puts a side, we ask for a sidewalk connection and and, uh, and we get it and then the next lot develops and, and they wanna put their building there because they can because of the setbacks and, and so forth. We, we're, we're at a little bit of a loss as far as how do we make that connection then. Uh, so, so, you know, master planning that out through the, through the mixed use center allows for that. So to kind of illustrate some of these, I'm gonna take you on a little Google tour of, of three different communities. They're all very uh, similar to Arvada in terms of, of size. I mean, they're all within within you know, 25, 30,000 people one way or the other. Uh, and we're gonna look, two of them are gonna be town centers and one's gonna be kind of a, a lot by lot redevelopment. We're gonna look at how they accomplish some of these. Uh, and, I, and interspersed in there, I'll have some, some Zoom polls, uh, mainly to do with building art, well, all to do with building architecture. And we're gonna use this to kind of start to get a, uh, we're, we're gonna be planning on doing a more 
in-depth visual preference survey and that'll be online uh, that'll be at speak up our beta and and when that's ready we will email you and we ask that you, you know if you can take some time to go log on and, and fill that out for us uh, we'll also be using a uh, asking some open-ended questions towards the end uh, through a, a through a, a third-party website that's really easy to access and one other last thing on the on the zoom polls uh, I just ask that you just kind of a caveat, focus on the architecture, you know, ignore the tenant, uh, ignore uh, landscaping treatments or signage or, or anything else that, that might distract you. We really just want to get at the architecture uh, and, and what the kind of first initial thoughts of what people are liking in art. All right. Next slide, please. So uh, first one we're going to go to in Belmar, and, and I want to caveat this by we're not we're not saying that uh, we should put Belmar in, in Newtown. It's, it's huge. It's 103 acres. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's already in Lakewood. We're just using this really as an example of some of these features. And it's one that most likely we assume that a lot of people that are in this meeting have, have actually been able to go out and see with their own eyes and experience it. So that's really why we chose Belmar. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of uh, looking, looking east from Alameda, you know, obviously elevated. And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is the, the kind of the dispersal of the parking garages. They're, they're really, the way you can identify them is with all the solar panels. So, uh, sorry here. Yes, there's, yeah, there's one. And then you got the one in the back corner towards the top of the screen. Uh, and then the one next to the Whole Foods, it's also, you know, there. And then there's a deck below it, as a lot of you probably know. And you know what this allows them to do is it allows them to really Alaska, which is this main street we're looking down. It's in my mind is kind of their east-west main street, and then Keller, which is right uh, kind of in the middle of the screen, is their kind of north-south main street, one street farther towards the top of the screen. Yep, there. That's Teller. So what that really what, what this does is it allows them to kind of keep these as main streets. They don't have a lot of driveway entrances. There's there's um, there's no access to the parking garages that I can think of off the top of my head on either one of those streets. Uh, that being said, Belmar obviously isn't afraid to use surface parking. They have surface parking around kind of the outside, but they do keep it kind of around the edge of the property. And and so they can really have their 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 commercial core uninterrupted by uh, as much vehicle traffic accessing buildings uh, properties as possible. Um, Another thing I just want to point out is the kind of the two big open spaces that were provided here. The one is the is the more urban one right in the center of the screen with the round building there. You know, a lot of you guys have probably been there. Maybe you've gone and ice skating in the winter time. You know, the restaurants in that building to the west sit. They have a lot of nice outdoor seating that that uses that. Uh, and then the and then the more natural park one that kind of sits tucked in between the the multifamily buildings. Uh, We'll, go, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but let's go to the next slide. So really, I just want to get a kind of the building, the architectural consistency here. You know, there's a lot of brick. Uh, the landscape treatments are very similar. You know, you can tell this was done by, uh, you know, through, through a, a single developer. It, it kind of speaks that way. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Again, again this, is, this is on Teller now, looking north, and it's similar. You know, yeah, we have different color bricks. But they're consistent. We have a similar storefront on the ground floor. The window spacing on the second floor is similar. They both incorporate some metal and some more modern features uh, in the building. You can't really see the one on the left, but it's it's there. Uh, next slide, please. And, and then Belmar kind of throws you a curveball. You know, you go from those brick buildings and you think, okay, this all kind of looks the same, and then you get uh, this very modern building that you know there's not a brick in sight that I can see. It, you know, it uses a lot of glass and a lot of a lot of metal. Uh, so this is one of the ones that we were kind of curious what people's thoughts were. We'll let this one go a little bit longer since uh, since uh, it's the first time. It's pretty self-explanatory though. We end that. Okay. 
not surprising. I, not a single I love it. That's, you know, I guess a, a little surprising, but not completely. Uh, I'm in agreement. I actually kind of like, I like a little bit of a different kind of building style and going a little bit different, but, uh, you know, this might not be the one, but I can completely, uh, I can completely understand where people are coming from with this one. Thank you. All right. So this here is, you know, um, it's kind of a, it's a, obviously a contemporary building. It's got some, it's got some uh, uh, modern, modern lines. It's very right angles, very straight lines. It's got some of these, the metal uh, elements here on the, on the side, but somehow it still manages to look uh, traditional. And so this is a, the next one we kind of like to know what you think about. So obviously example of a mixed use building, we have retail on the ground floor, uh, residential on the top three floors, uh, which, you know, going back to the target building while you guys are voting, you know, that obviously wasn't a mixed use building, but that's completely all right. You could have a, a single use building in a mixed use center. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. And Belmar does that uh, quite well. I mean, they have the, the, the Best Buy and the corner and, and the, the uh, Nordstrom Rack and some of those other single use buildings. All right, thank you. All right, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and go. I didn't realize I have to close this poll myself. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to some residential products that are found in Belmar. Uh, Belmar is actually kind of unique for town centers in that it has every, pretty much every single housing type. It has single family homes, duplex, townhomes, multi, you know, multifamily. Uh, it has a, a affordable housing, age restricted housing. It, it really runs a gamut. Here we're looking at uh, some townhomes, and these are a more traditional town townhome or more traditional building form, I should say, pitched roofs. They do intersperse some flat roofs in there, but to me, this speaks kind of like a traditional uh, architectural design. Uh, and so, we'd like to get your thoughts on this one too. So generally people, sorry, I didn't cover the results in the last one, I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, but in case somebody didn't notice or didn't take the time in the last one, people were generally, uh, generally liked it. Uh, so pretty overwhelmingly neutral on this one uh, with a little bit more people on the positive side than the negative. It's interesting. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. This uh, is a very modern residential building. This is actually the, the age-restricted affordable community. It's, it's actually restricted to seniors. This was built by uh, West Metro Housing Authority. Uh, at least I believe that was all true unless they changed their plans, so I, but I think that's correct. Uh, so again, not doesn't really carry through with some of the other themes we've seen in Belmar as far as not a lot, no brick on this one. Uh, a lot of bright colors, you know, not, not a focus on kind of the earth tones. Again, we'd like to know uh, what you think about this one, but I'm, I'm guessing we might already kind of know. Right. So I think even more strong, was it more dislike for this than the, than the uh, target building? I, I don't remember, but it's, it seems like we see a, a pattern here. Thank you. And next slide. All right, so here's another residential form. And to me, this is kind of a contemporary take on a very traditional building form. Uh, you know, with, this is actually a multifamily building. They've kind of designed it to try to look like townhomes by changing up the, the vertical uh, use of building materials, you know, as you as you move across it. So it almost gives a perception that, that it's a flat, it's, you know, it's, it's a, not a flat, but it's a, uh, it's, you know, a three-story townhome. But in reality, it is, they are flats, they are apartments. But to me, this almost, it's not the right color, but with the stoops and stuff, it almost kind of comes off as a, uh, as, 
a uh, brownstone. And do we have a poll for this one? And if not, can we maybe use the, the flexible poll that we created? Let's see here. Uh -huh. So again, uh, so this is flexible poll, but it's the same thing. How do you rate this building? What do you think of it? And again, I don't, I want you to rate it on, on the actual architecture. You know, this very well could be a townhome product versus a, a multifamily product. All right. Thank you for taking care of that, Noel. All right, so some like for this one. It's, uh, a couple of people hated it and a couple of people loved it, but most of the, the people were kind of in the in the middle with a slight, slight uh, more people liking it. Thank you. All right, next slide. And this is kind of what I think is really interesting about these three buildings is they're all essentially on the same street. You have the traditional product there on the left you have the uh, you you have the modern one at the end, and you have the the kind of the con contemporary take on a on a traditional building form on the right. I think that you know obviously Belmar. I talked about cohesive uh, architectural cohesion, uh, cohesiveness, and and that you know mixed use centers often do that really well. Well, Belmar has obviously chosen not to completely go that direction, and they've allowed for more variety than you might find in some other ones, including. The next one I'll show you. Uh, next slide. I'm going to move into just a little bit about the the open space. I mentioned this earlier in the opening slide that you know this is what this is their kind of their urban their hardscape one. And you know, going back to what I was talking about at, at the very beginning is it's hard. Like if, if these properties you know were developing separately, uh, how how would how would you get this space? You know you can't get one developer's not going to give it all. Uh, if they both came in at the exact same time and wanted to redevelop at the exact same time, you might be able to get, you know, the space from each of them to create something like this. But otherwise, it's really hard to get. So again, this is one of the things that these mixed use centers do well. Uh, and this one, you can't really see it very well because of the trees, but there is great uh, on the, on the left-hand side. All of those restaurants or, or restaurant and what used to—I'm not sure what's in the old world of beer—but you know, use that that uh, kind of take advantage of this plaza. On the right-hand side, you have offices and residential above overlooking it. Uh, so I just want to kind of highlight this this plaza and let's move on. All right, so parking, one of the issues that, that can come up when you're you, using these large parking structures in these mixed use centers or in any development, if you have a big enough development, you're using a large parking structure, especially one that is maybe the size of a block or, or has, has, an, has an edge on two or three sides of a block is you don't want to just be left all the time with a parking garage at the street level. So one way you can kind of, uh, one way you can you can kind of activate that street is with these little liner spaces. These uh, these are typically only 20 feet deep or so, and uh, and they are uh, they're a little different. There they can be used by mom and pop shops, by little people who need it, just need an office, and they and they provide some activation of the street. And you don't really lose out on any parking. And again, uh, okay, sorry. Next slide. Try and try not to focus on the comments. Somebody brought up the foreclosure of Belmar. Yes, that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, but this is really really about the design and and not not that that aspect of it. Uh, so I talked a little bit about internal connectivity, and I think Belmar does a decent job of internal connectivity. The picture on the left is uh, is. A covered walkway that goes from one of the parking garages kind of towards that center uh, plaza, the town square kind of uh, that we looked at earlier. And this goes across, you know, in what a lot of situations would be somebody else's property. Uh, and so this is something that a town center can do uh, better than, you know, uh, oftentimes better than lots of lot development. Similar to the right, this is this is a, a path that goes from the plaza to the grocery store, to the Whole Foods. And again, this is a big block. This would typically be going across, uh, you know, to you know somebody else's parcel. So, so how do you, you get those? And, and again, if, unless people are redeveloping at the same time, uh, these are hard to get in a in a lot by lot development. All right. So I think that wraps it up for for Belmar. Uh, next, we're going to one that probably most people aren't familiar with. This is uh, Sugarland Town Square. It's in Sugarland, Texas. And I'm not going to focus on all the elements on this one. I really wanted to bring this one up. Uh, 
because the one interesting thing about it is it's only 32 acres, so it's not large. You know, like I said, Belmar is I think 103 acres. Uh, so this is you know just for reference sake only. Our Vada marketplace is like 39 acres from the from the lake to the you know to the to the Wadsworth south of 52nd. I'm not saying bring out the bulldozers and scrape our Vada marketplace. I'm just trying to give you a sense of size. Uh, another aspect of this is a little different. This is almost all commercial and uh, kind of retail restaurant uh, mixed use. It's kind of a you know entertainment district at night. And it's really a working office space in the day, and it has uh, and and it's and it's kind of uh, anchored by the, the city hall actually moved in there, which is a big building on the kind of the bottom. Uh, and the other reason I wanted to bring this one up is it really, it has a really high degree of aesthetic consistency. You can really tell that that's what they were focused on in this one. So I wanted to give it kind of a counterpoint to Belmar. Let's, uh, uh, next slide, please. So this is just a different angle, but this is kind of really, this one only has one main street. It's that one street that you see in the center. And it's only about four blocks long. Uh, and this is very similar to Newtown in terms of, of, its, of, the, of its location adjacent to a state highway. That's a state highway along the south side of the, or sorry, I'm saying south, on the bottom of the page there. And then obviously that's a freeway on the right. So, you know, just like we have the freeway and Wadsworth, uh, this is, is adjacent to this same types of uh, classifications of streets. Uh, and another thing I want to point out with this is it's on the, on the left-hand side of this development, it's all uh, kind of auto-oriented uh, multi-tenant centers and they, they operate right next to each other and, and, it, and it works fine. So the next slide, please. So this is kind of right as you enter. You can see already uh, the amount of architectural consistency. They have a brick pattern across the road. They use the same decorative uh, decorative bollards. They have the same uh, brick patterns on either side in the sidewalks. Uh, the buildings, there's brick on every building. They throw on a little uh, a little uh, white or blonde stone to, to make them look more contemporary, but it's really almost formulaic in, in how, how consistent they are. Next slide, please. This is just going down a little bit and kind of showing again, uh, more brick uh, on the right. Again, you, you have some of these kind of projecting triangle windows are trying to give it a more modern look. Uh, and another thing that Sugarland Town Square does does well is it mixes everything from a single story buildings, which are at the very end of the street that we're looking at, you can just barely see it, uh, all the way up to, I believe, about a nine story uh, uh, office tower. So it really runs the gamut from one to nine stories. And I think it does a pretty good job of that. Let's go next slide, please. Uh, so this is about as, as, as outside the box as, as any of the buildings in Sugarland gets. It's a very, it's obviously one building, the center of it's a very traditional uh, brick building. And then on either end, it's hard to see the one on the left, but on either end, it, it kind of bookends it with this modern uh, architectural element. Uh, the, the, and this is kind of unusual in this area. This is, this is the one and only. Uh, I'm curious to see what people think about this kind of mixing of, of contemporary and traditional on the same page. Or on the same building. And since people are getting to use chat, why don't we go ahead and put some thoughts in chat there? We do have one question that's coming in from Lorraine, and we will try to get you answered tonight, or we'll certainly get back to you. But give Jake some yeah. input on this building. Yeah, what, tell me what you think. If, if you think, if, you know, if, if it strikes you one way or the other. It seems like I'm seeing that, you know, maybe the solely uh, modern buildings, not so much, but when you are able to kind of incorporate the two traditional and modern elements together, if you can do it well, that people uh, seem to like this. So I really appreciate that. Uh, next slide, please. I saw some people said they didn't like the big buildings. So here, here come the big buildings. Uh, these are the two tallest buildings in, in the Sugarland Town Square. Uh, the one on the right is a, is a hotel. Uh, you know, and I think it's a very traditional building. It's got that kind of corner element. That's another thing that Sugarland and almost all these buildings, I didn't point that out earlier, is they all have these corner elements. So it's obviously very important to the developer. Uh, and then the building on the left, uh, 
is kind of traditional in that it uses bricks, but it really, that corner element really is a, is a modern element, a lot of glass. Uh, and so we kind of proceed, wanted to get an idea of what people prefer, A on the left or B on the right. pretty overwhelming. I agree. Uh, I am a fan of, of B over A also. You know, and, and I think B, it's hard. Just, never mind. I was going to go off on a, on a rant about hotel architecture, but I'll keep it to myself. So um, next, we're going to a, a, an area that really developed on a lot by lot basis. And I think they did it really well. This is, this is we're going to be looking. This is what we're looking at right now is down what they call downtown Redmond. It didn't really have a typical or you know what what I think of was when I think of downtown. Uh, so this is kind of the area in question. And if you can look around you can, on here, you can see there's some kind of taller buildings that are, are relatively new. And and then you see uh, some of the older buildings that are surrounded by parking lots. Uh, and what we're going to focus on today is, is Cleveland Street. Next slide. I'll try to speed up. I, I realize I'm running a little long here. Uh, so this is Cleveland Street. This only started developing in like 2005, 2000. I think the first one of these new buildings came online in 2008, 2007. Uh, it, it won a 2019 Great Street Award from the American Planning Association. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about this as an example of, of how you can do some of this, you know, lot by lot development uh, well. Uh, one thing to take a note, uh, take note on this because I forgot to include a picture later is to the left of these buildings, you can see that green space with the trail running along it. That's actually an old, uh, an old abandoned rail line that they were able to convert into a park. But it also it has kind of two, in my mind, it has kind of two. Uh, uh, it has two effects on, the, on it. One is you can't access any of those buildings from the back. There's no alley access. There's no, you know, back street. So all of the access has to be taken off of Cleveland Street, which they were trying to activate and make pedestrian friendly. So th they're also introducing themselves a, a difficulty to that by having cars have to cross that sidewalk into uh, the parking areas. The other thing it does is it provided a common open space that the developers of the individual, individual property owners didn't have to provide themselves. It was already there. It was provided through the vacation of the railroad right away in the city building out uh, a trail system with a small park. So next slide, please. So this just shows you, uh, this is Google Street View in 2008 on the left and 2019 on the right. And I promise you, I didn't use any filters or anything like that. It just happened to, you know, that the Northwest had light or had, you know, sunny skies in 2019, the day the, the uh, Google driver was driving down the street. So this kind of shows you a little bit of what was there. Uh, you know, one thing I want to point out here is, is, you know, when, when we're talking about redevelopment, it's not, doesn't mean wholesale redevelopment of every building. It can also lead to reinvestment in existing building stock, which is what you see there on the building. And the 2019 one on the right, that building has been completely refurbished. Uh, new windows and new uh, storefront windows, uh, and obviously a new facade. Uh, next slide, please. This is just going down the street a little farther. Again, this is Google Street Views from the same years. Uh, in this building on the left, that, as you can see it on both pictures, that was kind of the first building that, that started, uh, came online here and kind of was an impetus or catalytic to the redevelopment. You also see on the right, there's a park uh, and in today's picture, the 2019, whereas on the other one, it was buildings. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but the city essentially built a park. Uh, next slide. We're just going to have some. Uh, so this is this is an example of what can happen in a uh, lot by lot development. You have old building stock, you have new building stock, and and again, I'm not saying I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. It's just it's just what happens. It's a matter of fact. And uh, this is an example. If you go back and look at the street view pictures of these two buildings from 2008, uh, it appears that there's been a significant amount of reinvestment in those buildings too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just kind of giving you, trying to give you a feel for, for the district. Uh, you know, not necessarily a lot of our aesthetic consistency. There's some different colors. You see some yellow, you see some uh, grays, uh, some red, you see some modern buildings. And, and if we get down, you'll see some less modern buildings. Next slide. Now this is kind of looking at the end of the corridor. And again, you see on the right, there's a, it's actually an old mattress store there. Um, next, you know, right across the street, new development with uh, activated ground floors, 
uh, a real lively pedestrian environment. Uh, next, please. Okay, so this is that building I was talking about that just kind of started off that on one on the right anyways. And it's a very interesting building. It has a, it has a very traditional ground floor. It's brick, you know, it's, it's very traditional. And then up above, it, it has a lot of building articulation. And when we, when we say building articulation, we mean projections and recesses. And it's a lot of use of materi different materials, different colors. Uh, and then the building actually directly to the left of it, uh, which is also the building number A, is a much more modern building. It's clean lines. It doesn't use a lot of different uh, features. I'm not saying any of these buildings are winning architectural design awards. I'm just trying to illustrate uh, kind of the difference between them. Uh, A also, on the set of using brick, it has just unfinished natural concrete. It's very minimalistic, minimalist uh, approach to a building. Uh, and so we kind of want to know what's your preference? A on the left, B on the right. And for those people that are answering, you know, one way or the other, I'd be curious of, of what, what it is, you know, is it the colors, is it the articulation, is it uh, the materials? Uh, and please identify which building you're talking about if you can, so we, we know when we're looking back through the chat. Thank you. All right, I'm almost done, I promise. So this is just a block off Cleveland, but we wanted to show you, obviously you saw a lot of Cleveland had a residential on um, the other first stories, but we, want, we wanted to show you uh, a, a non-residential building, a commercial building. Uh, again, this is kind of a more modern building, it's square shape. It does use some, some uh, the, the ground floor is hard to see with the trees, but it is brick. It does use some masonry uh, and kind of has a repeating square pattern in the windows. I'm liking some of the answers from the previous one. I appreciate that. All right. And, and it, I like that people are throwing in comments here, uh, that, you know, because we will keep these comments uh, and appreciate that and, and use them to kind of uh, guide, you know, next steps. All right, here, close that out. All right, so this is that. This is the the uh, park I was telling you about. Again, one of the one of the hard parts when you have lot by lot development is to get a large open space. You know that can be used by all these new residents you're introducing, or all by all these new users. They could be daytime users through offices, uh, or or you know uh, you know users that actually move to the area. So this is something that the city of Redmond did. Uh, they had to buy and relocate all the businesses over there. This park, I think, I found a fact sheet on it. it cost the city forty one million dollars to build. Uh, and granted, a lot of that money they might have gotten from the park, park, park fees in lieu of parkland dedication for all those residential units. But this is just shows you that you know with this type of development, sometimes uh, somebody else has got to be responsible for some of the common amenities. And then they also, like I said, the opening slide they had that trail uh, along the backside that they were fortunate enough to get. All right. So next slide. So this is kind of a, the parking, the parking issue, this is two ways to address it that you have in these types of, of uh, developments where each building has to park itself. The one on the right is a hotel, it's two hotels, they're both Marriott's, and they kind of share, obviously shared parking. They have a large surface lot, they did put the buildings towards the street to create a more pedestrian friendly environment, uh, and they, they have a small parking garage there uh, on the back too. And the building on the left, which is on Cleveland Street, uh, provides all of its parking underground and, and, and underneath that first deck there that the amenity deck is on the back. Uh, another thing that the Cleveland, that, that the city of Redmond did really well that they, they were thoughtful about is when they had these, when these buildings were designed, they made sure that they could use shared parking. So if you look at the parking is taken off the bottom of the building on the left and there's a, a newer concrete drive there. And that's meant to not only serve that building, but if the parcel below it redevelops, they will be required to pull their parking in off of that same drive. So it minimizes those pedestrian impacts that I was talking about uh, that can potentially happen when you have uh, each building parking itself. Next slide, I think that's my last one. So this is also kind of a similar situation. These two buildings develop differently. They use the same shared drive aisle. So you only have one cut, you only have one conflict with pedestrians. But the other thing that's neat about this, this is that park I was talking about earlier, that was the old rail uh, right of way. They also use the same path as the kind of internal pedestrian connectivity between the park and the park across the street and the front of the buildings and the restaurants and so forth. 
So this is kind of using uh, the driveway for both purposes, which I, I thought was uh, pretty in, uh, thoughtful. All right, lastly, last Zoom poll. I really appreciate it. Thanks for putting up with me. I went a little long. All right, how important is uniformity of design in a district? Just generally speaking, uh, I think I, I tried to show you some that were not, some that were, were very uh, uniform and, and some that kind of, you know, this one kind of uh, not so much. Somebody say uniformity, no, but cohesive, yes. I'd love it to if you would expand on that in the in the chat. All right, thank you very right. much. Thank you so very much. we'll be passing it off to uh, Patty, and she's going to talk a little bit about transportation. Thank you, Jake. I'll go over this as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, the transportation network is a prominent element within this study area. The Newtown sub area planned study area is bisected by Wadsworth Boulevard, which is a state highway. And Interstate 70 is located on the southern boundary. The Gold Line, which is a regional rail line and a transit hub, are located on the northern border of the sub area plan area, just south of Old Town Arvada. The transit hub supports the rapid transit system and the old town station that is located just north of the rail line. Bus service and numerous routes are provided within the study area, primarily along Wadsworth Parkway bypass and 52nd Avenue. Next slide, please. The bike and trail system in this area includes paved trail connections um, with some bike access located along Wadsworth Boulevard bypass and West 52nd Avenue. There is a non-paved trail that connects on the east side of the study area, and those are shown on the green lines on the, on the map. Bike routes are shown with the turquoise lines and the future funding for the bike trail projects are also shown and they are located in the, influence areas, um, not within the sub area study area. No parks are located within the study area as well. However, Columbine Park and Foster Park are located to the east. Stocky Walter and McElvey Park is to the north and Griffith Station Park is to the west. Next slide, please. This portion of the presentation is really important to identify and learn from you what you consider the opportunities and challenges in this new town area. Opportunities are considered things that build off the strengths or assets within the area and comments previously shared by the community are on the slide as examples. Um, it, unfortunately that I can't read those right now. For example, in the opportunity area, if, the North Old Town Arvada is considered an opportunity just being north of the project area. We will transfer over to a menti.com tool. And Noel, would you mind explaining that a little bit further and how they can interact on this tool to provide feedback for opportunities within the area? Absolutely. Maybe some of you have already gotten in there. So go ahead and take out your telephone, another device, toggle over to another open window on the internet on your computer, and you can type in what you see on the top of the screen there, menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and you'll be asked for a code, and that code is 291159. Let us know if you're having any difficulties. Start to see at least one answer is coming in. Another. Can you repeat the context of the question? What are the opportunities? Absolutely. What do you consider the, yeah, I'm sorry, Noel. Um, what do you consider the opportunities located within this area that would contribute to developing the sub area plan? Um, for example, an opportunity may be with land use components is that we're having experiencing changing retail trends. Um, also another opportunity is that the RT RTD hub and the transit station are considered assets for this 
area and can contribute to developing the plan. Um, and then also I wanted to mention if you are having difficulty using the Menti site, you can please put, you can put your um, comments in the chat portion as well and we'll add those to manually so that we can provide that information. I really appreciate this great feedback. Um, again, walkable extension of Old Town, um, Old Town itself and having that connectivity. Uh, move the area more accessible for walking, biking and rolling or make, excuse me, make the area more accessible. Uh, the surrounding neighborhoods, um, that's a nice opportunity for this area and also providing connectivity for those. Uh, wow, a lot of great comments. We really appreciate your feedback. In the interest of, I'm, I'll give you another minute to hopefully if you want to provide more information. And will, Noelle, if you would mind letting me know, can we keep the menti.com up for a while if they want to add more comments onto that? Absolutely. We have it open right. so you can add as many as you want and you can move forward with the prompts into what are the challenges of this area. Okay, thank you. Um, then also then I'll quickly move to the next slide, please. So now we would like to get your feedback as well on the challenges for this area. Uh, we have received previous comments that included traffic and safety along Wadsworth Boulevard as a challenge for this sub area plan. And we would like for you to share your ideas for the opportunity, excuse me, for the challenges in this area. If you could please again use the Mentimeter that is listed and the code that's on top. If you're not able to do that, please add your comments in the chat section and we will certainly make sure we get those on there as well. Uh, just quickly, traffic bottlenecks off of I-70, more traffic concerns. Um, crossing Wadsworth is a barrier. Uh, we have heard that before, so appreciate your comment. Too many big box stores that have way too much parking. So um, that is something to consider as we go through this process. And frequency of rail lines as it relates to the Old Town Nevada Transit Station. Um, free parking again. I think we had a few comments. There's a lack of a grocery store. The light at 54th and Wadsworth is a challenge. Um, also nooks and crannies. Oh, great comment from Audrey from previous for opportunities providing nooks and crannies for smaller businesses. And I think that is a quick summary of some of the comments, um, homeless population and drug users um, with not enough police presence. So those are again, in the interest of time, I wish we could spend more time on this, but if you could please go to menti.com and enter that as well, that would be greatly appreciated. And then next slide, thank you, Noel. is if you have any questions, we're running a little um, closer to, the, uh, we're actually wrapping up right about now, but we will keep on the, on the meeting after we finish the next section, which is very short about next steps. And if you'd like to hang on and, and ask questions for us, please stay on. We'll stay on for about 10 or 15 minutes after we wrap up. Um, please know that you can always ask questions or provide comments on our website, which is advancearvada.org. That is our long range planning website in which you can always provide feedback at any time. And we will we'll certainly respond to questions as well. There's a there's a tab in that as an option in which you can ask questions as well. So if we miss you tonight, please contact us personally or um, go onto our website and ask those questions. So the next steps are for this plan development is that we, um, after this meeting, we will have additional opportunity to provide more feedback as Jake mentioned earlier with some of the design concepts and we'll also include opportunity and challenges um, on our Speak Up Arvada platform. And you can, again, always at any time, provide your comments or questions on advancearvada.org website. Um, please stay tuned and we'll provide updates on the website as well. And also we'll send follow-up emails to those who participated tonight or who are on our email list. Um, we, 
I really appreciate the um, turnout this evening. We really appreciate all the great comments. I've been reading through those as we've been going through uh, this meeting. We will use the information that you provided tonight into the next phase of the project. You've given a lot of great information and homework for us to work as we proceed and move forward developing the plan. The next public meeting that will be scheduled this summer, and we will bring you more of the developed plan and its framework at that time for your comments and any questions. Please help us spread the word about this sub area planning effort. Again, really appreciate your time this evening. Um, share with your friends and neighbors so that we can get the most input and public feedback that makes our plan better. And then thank you again for taking the time out tonight and please contact if you have any questions and have a good evening. And we'll stay on a few more minutes for those who have some questions. Thank you very much. Oh, oh good. Some people stayed on. I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulty, difficulty so I apologize. Oh, well, thank you, Dana, for your comment. I appreciate that. Um, Trader Joe's coming to the city. We certainly can share that with Economic Development Department. Oh, thank you, Kate, as well. Thank you. I re really appreciate your participation. And I, if anybody has any, type them in, and we'll go through those for the next 10 minutes. I'm not seeing any. Anybody else on the team, are you seeing any questions? Was there one there? There was yeah. a question about the uh, schedule uh, moving forward. Oh, oh, I'm yeah, I don't, I thank you, Rob. So um, we're in the initial phase of this project. It started back in last, um, sep actually last fall in 2020. And we're anticipating to complete this project by the end of the year. Uh, there are three uh, community meetings scheduled at this time. This is the first one in which we're asking for your initial feedback to help develop the vision of the plan. The next meeting will be in the summer where we will take all this information back um, and synthesize it and develop it with our committees as well and then come back to you in the summer with the framework of the plan. And then as we go through and there'll be another meeting in the fall, hopefully we have a draft for you at that time. And then we move forward to adoption towards the end of the year. Where are you looking for questions? Um, on the chat option, I'm unfortunately, I'm not seeing them on my screen. Did you, you're, you're on, you're, you're speaking. Go ahead, Todd, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. For, for landowners who have, uh, you know, current, interest in in initiating a project what kind of bandwidth do you have in the near term to sort of look at you know um early opportunities to start implementing some of these ideas you have or is it you know is it ultimately you think you're going to defer some of the you know some of the approvals and, and moving forward until you've got the plan fully baked oh the the land development code was adopted last year, so that will continue and we will continue processing um, applications for this area for development. So this plan is anticipation of for long term vision. So this effort will not stop development applications from continuing at this time. Is that yeah, no, I, I hope I I, I understand that, but question? it sounded and forgive me, I'm not trying to be combative, but it sounded no. Like a very bureaucratic answer. I know. I know you're. You're. You've got. You know. Code processing and 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 so forth. But for people that are interested in in submitting projects that might fold into the longer term plan, um, I, I. In all honesty, I've had. I've had difficulty in the past. Um, I've had resistance, in in you know plan or proposed development projects, and so. Um, I think what you're doing is great. And I think there's opportunities for people that have immediate ideas or, or, or opportunities for infill in my case. Um, and I'm just wondering to what extent are, are you motivated to start overlaying kind of this plan and, and the opportunities it represents to the, you know, to the traditional, you know, we have the code as long as you, you know, here's the things you have to submit, they have to meet code and so forth. 
and, and I'll, take a, I'll take a stab at answering that. Uh, so my name's Jake. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, we really have we really can implement a lot of a lot of this stuff already. This plan is really to further refine our regulatory framework and, and you know potentially maybe uh, go back and, and make some amendments if, if we find it's necessary out of this. But really, you know, the mixed use zoning is in place. Uh, the, the the kind of setbacks and lot coverage in the parking, like Cheryl mentioned, they're they're all in place. So right now, I mean, we we could accommodate a lot of this this type of stuff we talked about today. Okay, I, I, it's it's kind of attitudinal because I mean, obviously, you can wait for the big box stores to move out and and have big blocks of land to work with, or you can start working with you know people that have you know kind of immediate opportunities with not a lot of impediments that ultimately could be geared towards supporting your long-term vision rather than just you know we're going to do this in the interim or it's a you know it's a band-aid because obviously you know for somebody that wants to do something new at this point folding into the longer term vision makes more sense than something that's going to be a one-off yeah i agree well, yeah thank you for your comment i appreciate that um we do have a and few as we more... oh, go ahead patty no yeah go ahead I was just going to say, we have a few more questions out there. Um, yeah. One is, how is this aligned with the comprehensive plan? It, it actually is in um, the land development code. When that was updated last year, that was in alignment with the comprehensive plan. So what was presented tonight is um, meets the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan and actually will those will evolve as we go through this developing this plan is expand upon or go further into the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan so it is consistent with the land use is consistent with the comprehensive plan yeah the, the future land use designation in this area was uh, mixed use i believe uh it has been yes. for a number of years since the adoption at least since the adoption of the 2014 uh a long range plan, comprehensive plan. Somebody else asked, you know, about whether we'll be taking down uh, homes and, and other people's property. The city has no, absolutely zero intention of, of going in and, and uh, you know, using eminent domain or anything like that to remove things. We're just looking about as, we're looking at as redevelopment occurs naturally and as there's opportunities for redevelopment, what happens. Somebody else asked about, you know, will the design guidelines be codified? That's a question that we'll answer through this planning process uh, you know, is it something that there's a strong appetite for with the community? Uh, does does our uh, planning commission and city council uh, agree with that? So that's kind of something we'll 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 get to through this process. I thought I saw some other ones. Uh, somebody talked about you know more residents need more new you know walkable grocery store. Couldn't agree with you more. I also live in similar close to this area, and I would love to be able to walk to a grocery store. And Jake, we have quite a few that have come through Menti as well. And it looks like we have 25 people still on the call with us. Do you want me to bring up some of those questions? Sure, let's do it. Great. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, thank all you. Right. And I, um, Patty, I think it's fair to say that we'll collect all the questions as well as with the recording and, and uh, someone requested the poll questions as well to get input from their neighbor. We'll follow up with all of that after the call. Who wants it to take provide that? A summary. Yeah, we'll provide a summary on the website as well of all of these of the responses tonight and the poll results. So thank you. What are the long term goals for city planning in Arvada? Um, can you read? I mean, currently, as I mentioned earlier, are for long range planning, we're working on doing these sub area plans in multiple areas of the city. Uh, we're currently working on a sub area plan. And again, it's a similar process and goal of creating a future vision for these areas. Another plan area we're working on is Square Lake over by Sheridan and the um, Sheridan and Tennyson. And then, and we're doing that collaboratively with Adams County and another sub area plan that is currently in the works as well is in the Northwest Arvada area. So as we go through these, um, this is the plan to do multiple sub area planning um, for those areas identified that we think we're going through um, redevelopment or infill change within the next five to 10 years. We'll be going through 
developing these similar sub area plans in other parts of the city um, in the next few years. Are there next any question. view protected corridors? Yes. Oh, good. You can read it. Yes, thank you. Connections to the water tower. I am not aware of any. Um, I, Cheryl, do you mind um, taking this question? So I think that's a question that we're going to answer through this process. If we can increase connectivity into the water tower, it's both from a pedestrian aspect as well as bicycles and other multi multimodal methods. Um, as far as whether or not there are any protected view corridors, we haven't adopted any specific corridors that um, have been ad adopted. Um, we have studied the issue um, as the, when we adopted the land development code, there were a lot of um, examples of different views that were available and what the different height, um, what kind of impact those would have on the area. Um, so that was all taken into consideration when we updated the land development code and adopted the new heights. Allie, maybe you could answer this one. Was our council member aware of this meeting? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we did uh, promote uh, this meet. We did communicate to city council about the meeting tonight. Yes. Somebody said they'd love to pick my brain. I'm more than open to it. You can uh, you can email uh, uh, our uh, advance at arvada.com. Just put my name in it. It'll get forwarded to me, and then uh, I'll respond. And, and we definitely talk uh, more than more than willing to. Uh, just to help you out, Jake, it's actually advance at arvada.org. Did I not say that? I'm sorry. No, <laughs> Thank it's okay. you. I just want to make sure. Allie, that I even wrote it down before the meeting just to help myself, and I still failed. And we can put that in the chat as well. And there was also a question about Trader Joe's, and we um, can seek information about that from Aida. We talked about the schedule and the timing before. Um, Absolutely, we talked about sending that survey. Uh, the survey the will be posted on on uh, advancedarbata.org. We'll 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 notify everybody when that when that's ready as far as the the more detailed uh, visual preference architectural survey. How is this aligned with the comprehensive plan? We we answered that one, I think. We did. What are the so these street, the street setbacks are actually already in place. Uh, they're in the land development code we adopted in May. Uh, so it, there's different there's different street setbacks uh, depending on the zoning, uh, and there's it, it actually a range. You have to be within that range, and, and a certain amount of your building has to be in that range. So you might have a setback of 10 to 20 feet, and then you might have a requirement that 40% uh, of your total lot width has to have a building within that area, and that's that's all in our in our uh, adopted land development code. And it does change from zone district to zone district. Uh, we answered that one. Yep, we answered that. Absolutely not. No, yeah, this was that was not the the uh, idea at all. I mean, I don't think that's even feasible uh, to have one developer do the whole thing. It was really. You know, we do have some large parcels in there, and by just combining a couple of them, you could have the opportunity to see some smaller scale mixed use centers. So we just wanted to show that that that, that is a potential option, but it's it's the un, I mean, it's not the likely one. The likely one is just to see uh, individual lots redeveloped by the existing owner or future owner. That's an interesting one. Uh, you know, we, we are obviously always open to adaptive reuse. Unfortunately, the adaptive reuse, I shouldn't say unfortunately, that's bad. The adaptive reuse we often see is not real adaptive reuse. It's turning them into gyms, turning them into uh, churches, uh, turning them into other types of, of, of uh, users that, that aren't really fundamentally changing the use of the building or, or, the, or the, the act, you know, how, how the building activates the area. But that's how we would consider any adaptive reuse that met the code requirements. So it's happening at the at, at the southeast corner of 52nd and Marshall. There's nothing actually happening now. There is a conditional use uh, application in to put uh, like a 260 some 
uh, 270 some residential units uh, using uh, the low income uh, LIHTC, the tax credits for housing, low income housing tax credit. Uh, so that they've got to get that conditional use approval before they can even come through with a, a site plan. Uh, and then after they get the conditional use approval, they have to get their tax credits awarded through CHAFA. So uh, it's the first step in a long process. Nobody would have to move out, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're planning on potential, uh, potential redevelopment in the area. So some of it may stay the same, you know, some of it may not. That Home Depot does exceptionally well, we hear in, in the state. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, I think Costco also does really well in that location. So uh, nobody's being forced out. It's really as properties redevelop, what, what can we do? And this plan will help us envision what that might be. Sorry, I don't mean to take all these people want to jump in. Thank you, Jake. Uh, actually, uh, we work whenever we have a project that is located within the area. We try we contact the the planning departments through um, referral processes for development applications, um, and then for long range planning. Right now, we are working with Adams County on a sub area plan effort in in the east side of the of Arvada, and we're always including representatives from surrounding cities and jurisdictions that a project may be related to with our committees and we get their feedback as well as we go through this as we go through long range planning um, efforts such as this sub area plan. Ooh, good question. <laughs> well, that I don't have an answer for and it is something I, it, we'd have to work with AIDA as well and Aura about this time, these type of tax districts. Um, so we can take a look at that and get an answer back to you um, at a later date. Um, again, uh, th that hasn't been determined through this process. It may be something as a design consideration. Jake, you want to jump in for this one if you're planning on making yeah, they're really asking about, are we, are we going to keep Old Wadsworth as a pedestrian street like it has been through the pandemic? Uh, I, from, I'm from i not involved in those decisions. Nobody really on here is, but, you know, just what we've heard is that there's a lot of interest in the business community. So I think it's being explored. I, I definitely do not think there's any decision has been made in regards to that. Oh, is that it, Noelle? Yes, and that was all the questions. Somebody, well, somebody asked about, I, I, somebody asked about how- Go ahead, Jake. I was going to say, somebody asked about how this will affect tax revenues, and, and that's a tough question. You know, uh, they brought up Arvada Marketplace. You know, one easy way that could be looked at is, you know, if you looked at what does Arvada Marketplace bring into the city annually in taxes, and then you go down and, and look at uh, some other development of similar size, you know, that's developed, you know, like the, like the Sugarland Town Center, for example, and look at try to figure out what that brings in in, in, in taxes. Uh, and, and I'm guessing uh, that there's, there's not a loss. Uh, that's a tough, uh, tough question. Tough, tough. Yeah. But with the changing- Well, I want to say- Sorry. Go ahead, Jay. No, no, no. Uh, no. I just, right. I'll censor myself. I really want to say thank you again and really appreciate your time and feedback at this meeting. Um, I'm really encouraged by the amount of um, information we received and we're looking forward to moving, um, taking that information back and moving into the next phase. And again, we'll have a community meeting um, sometime in the summer. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll, we'll provide updates and send out emails with that information as well. Uh, again, thank you everybody and have a great evening. Thank you.